from his journey was sitting beside the well and it was about the sixth hour or it was about noon at that time. You know, we see two things in this little account about the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the, the scripture tells us that Jesus became flesh and dwelt among us. As it has been said, Jesus was very man, but he was very God. He was just as much God as he were not a man, and just as much man as he were not a God. And we see this here. We're going to see his omniscience here in just a minute. But here we see his humanity. In order to go from Galilee in, into Samaria on the way to Galilee, it is a constant climb. A constant climb. And they had been walking. It was over 20 miles uh, to get to where he went. And by the time he got there, he was tired. And he was thirsty. And he was hungry, as we'll see in a moment. And he says it was about the sixth hour, around noon. Then it says, A woman from Samaria came to draw water. And Jesus said unto her, Give me a drink. He was thirsty. Now, there's a lot going on here. Here you have a Jew in Samaria, and here comes a Samaritan woman to draw her water at noon. And we're going to find out some things about this woman uh, because she was not the kind of woman even the other Samaritan women wanted to be with. Because they normally drew water in the evening. She came by herself uh, at noon because she in many ways was a social uh, cast out, if you please. And Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Now first of all, Jewish men did not speak to women in public. Further, Jews did not speak. Most of them did not want to have Samaritan dirt on their feet. And they did not interact with Samaritans. And they did not speak to Samaritans. And for Jesus to speak to this Samaritan woman got her attention. And he said, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Now we're going to see here, and we can just gather, that the Lord Jesus Christ was not a racist. He didn't hate these Samaritans like everybody else did. Now, just a little history lesson right quickly. Who were the Samaritans? You know, after the reign of, of Solomon... The kingdom divided under Jeroboam and Rehoboam. And under Jeroboam uh, became the nation, half nation of Israel. And he was the first king. And uh, then on the Judah side you had Rehoboam. He just had Judah and Benjamin. And he was the king. Well, because of their rebellion and because of their sin... Eventually the Samaritans came into the land and took Israel, over a hundred years before Judah, took Israel captive, took most of the people out of the land, left the poorest of the Jewish people there, and then brought different Gentile people from different nations that the Assyrians had defeated and planted them there. Consequently, the Jews intermarried uh, with uh, these Samaritans or with these Gentiles thus producing Samaritans and uh, not only that but they did not accept the Old Testament only the Pentateuch only Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy and uh, they did not go to Jerusalem they did not go to the temple they worshiped there in their, in their land and we'll see more about that. in, But that's who these people were. And the Jews hated them because they what they had done was just terrible. They had intermarried and they did not observe the word of God and they did not go to the temple. So a lot of the Jews would have nothing uh, to do with these people. But Jesus asks for a drink. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, 
Ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria. And then John puts a little footnote, a little parenthesis in there, for the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. She was shocked that this Jew, this, man, this Jewish man, would speak to her. Verse 10, Jesus uh, answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that says unto you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Jesus is saying to this woman, now let me just say to you, and I said this last week, but I want to say this right quick. It is so interesting that Jesus would go to Samaria, I mean a cursed land, a land that people had a lot of prejudice against, people that were unclean and unholy and just cast off of the Jewish faith, and he's going to come uh, here to Samaria, and, and he will go so far, as we'll see in a minute, to identify himself as the promised Messiah. The question comes, why would he do it here? Why wouldn't he have done it in Jerusalem? Why wouldn't he have done this in the previous chapter with Nicodemus? Why would he have not gone to Jerusalem with the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all? Why didn't he do it there? Why would he speak to this woman? I think there's a variety of reasons. Number one, we see that the Jews had taken the Jewish faith which ought to lead them to Christ and they had so perverted it that he did not take it to them but he goes to these despised people and this lowest of the low and in so many words saying listen God loves you too amen and he said if you knew the gift of God and who it is that says to you give me to drink you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said unto him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get this living water? It's kind of like the discussion that Jesus had with Nicodemus about being born again and Nicodemus said, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? But Jesus was talking about a spiritual birth, a spiritual resurrection. He was talking about his spiritual need. Then he said in verse 12, Are you greater than our father Jacob? Now I told you the other day that I write in my Bible. There's a place in my Bible that I write. Lie. That's a lie. And I don't have to kind of, that'll, that'll make you wonder about me, but there's lies in the Bible. People tell lies in the Bible. But in, you, you see different occasions like that. He said, are you greater than our father Jacob? And you know how to answer that question? Yes, he is greater than Jacob. He gave us this well and drank from it himself and his sons and his livestock. And Jesus said unto her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But, what, uh, but whosoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never thirst again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up into eternal life. As I say to you, there's just so much here. And, but one thing that is happening here, Jesus is initiating the conversation, trying to... to uh, to start a conversation with this woman where she, he could talk to her about his soul and we have to learn to do that because most people are not going to bring it up to you. A few people will. Few people in my ministry have ever done that. But you have to initiate the conversation and that's what uh, she And she was shocked that he would ask for some water and, and she was talking about physical water and he was talking about uh, spiritual water and he said, I, I, I can... Uh, uh, I can give you water that will spring up into everlasting life. The woman said unto him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty 
nor have to come to this water again. Now that's how far we got last week. But I want you to know as we, we start, that's the introduction by the way. Uh, something is fixing to happen here. The Lord is going to reveal some things that I want you to know that most people don't get out of this scripture when they read it, when they just read over it. What did he say in that, uh, what did she say in that 15th verse? Jesus said, give me a drink. And she said, how is it that you're a Jew asking me a drink who's from a Samaritan woman? And he said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that's talking, if you just knew who I am, if you just knew know who is speaking to you, you would have asked him. And let me say, uh, I said this in Sunday school, almost every religion today will say, if you will do this and do this and do this, then I will do this. But Christianity says, are you ready for this? Ask. Ask. Because our salvation is not dependent upon what we do. It's dependent upon what the Lord Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross. Ask, he said. Verse 15. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water, so thou and I will not be thirsty or have to come to draw water. Now I want you to, I want you to know that that verse is where the majority of American Christians and evangelism is. We're interested in what the Lord can do for us, how the Lord will help us, how the Lord will provide for us, how the Lord will help us, and He will do all of those things. Just ask, just believe, just trust the Lord Jesus Christ. Just pray this little prayer. But what I want to say to you and what the Scripture is saying to us, that's not good enough. What did Jesus do? In verse 16, Jesus said to her, Go and call your husband and come here. He didn't just say, well... Take this little ditty and go ahead. And he said, go get your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying that you have no husband. For you have had five husbands. And the one you now have is not your husband. Now, I want you to know that there were other problems in the life of this woman other than this rather enormous issue here, her morality. There were other problems. There are people today who are not uh, involved in what we would call gross sin. But the Bible says we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We need to deal or allow the Lord Jesus Christ to deal with the sin in our lives. The Lord did not go along with her and when she said, give me this, give me this water, He said, go get your husband. He is endeavoring to help her to come to terms with the sin in her life. He said the latter part of verse 18, what you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Now, things are changing. I perceive that thou, she is recognizing now. She's not recognizing that he's the Savior, but she is recognizing that he has a source from God. Before long, she's going to go to town and she's going to tell the people of her village, I want you to come and see a man who has told me everything that I've ever done. She begins to recognize something in him. She said, I perceive that you are a prophet. Now then, she she, she, she's going to bring up another issue, verse 20. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, 
But you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Now, there, there, there were issues. There were issues. I want you to know that racism is not a new thing. And the Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans. And by the way, the, the Samaritans had no dealings with the Jews. It was a two-way street. They had a common basic ancestry, but because of what had happened, they had, they had separated from one another, and most Jews wouldn't even, we'd, wouldn't even go through that country. They didn't want to have anything to do with them. And, um, but she brings up this issue, our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and that was Mount Gerizim. I don't know whether you remember or not, but when you read the book of Nehemiah, when Nehemiah came, um, was allowed to come to rebuild, rebuild the walls, rebuild Jerusalem, when he got there, this, there was a fellow by the name of Sam Ballot that came and said, hey, we worship the same God that you do and we want to help you build the walls. And uh, Nehemiah said, no, you don't have anything to do with that. Guess what Sam Ballot was? He was Samaritan. And they, they didn't and come to find out they didn't, they didn't have good ambitions in their heart for these people to, to help. They, they became a real hindrance, if you please. But Sam Ballot's son-in-law started the religion that the Samaritans, now they, they feigned to worship God, but they didn't accept the Old Testament Scriptures except the first five books. And they would not go to Jerusalem. And that's what she's talking about here. They, were, they are divided culturally and they are divided religiously if you speak. He, she says in verse, verse 20, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour... Now this, 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 is, this is a big stuff. This is... Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is a spirit, and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Then in verse, let me just go ahead and read it. Verse 25, she says, the woman said unto him, I know that Messiah is coming. He who is called Christ, when he comes, he will tell us all things. Now, let me just see if I can pull this together right quickly. Um, when, she, when she says to him, uh, where are we supposed to worship? Are we supposed to worship here on this mountain or in Jerusalem? You say Jerusalem. And Jesus went on to say, salvation of the, is of the Jews. I want you to know in our modern culture that would have been a politically incorrect statement to make, even though it was true. Because God had determined that He would call Abraham, then Isaac, then Jacob, then the patriarchs, among the patriarchs, Judah, and from Judah, Jesse, and from Jesse, David, and from the lineage of David would come the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, he was, who she was talking to right here. And it was through the Jews, he chose the Jews 
And if there was ever an unlikely bunch of people, it would have been the Jews because they were not a mighty nation. They went in, they went into Egypt, about 75 people, and came out a few million, but that was nothing compared to the other nations. And God was with them and God gave them the law and God gave them the word of God and God gave them the patriarchs and God gave them the prophets and it was through the lineage of the Jews that the Messiah would come. That was all true. But he went on to say the time, hang on now, the time is going to come when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem Will you worship me? You say, what? What's going on here? We've got to understand that with the coming of Christ, and we've already seen from the turning of the, of the cleansing water in Cana into wine and the cleansing of the temple and other things that and, and even the ministry of John the Baptist as he called the religious leaders hypocrites, there is a transition that is, that is happening here. And she's saying, well, should we follow God in our, with our deal or with your deal? Should we worship in this mountain or should we worship in Jerusalem? He said, listen, the time is coming, the time is coming when you will not worship in, any, in, e, in either place. Because the Lord wants, uh, wants those who will worship Him in spirit and in truth. You know what's going to happen after the rejection of Christ and the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Christ in about 30 years? Titus and the Roman army is going to come into Israel and they're going to destroy the temple. They're going to burn down the walls. Uh, they're, they're going to take people into captivity. He, they're going to bring... The, the temple to an end. They're going to bring the synagogue to the end. He's going to bring Pharisees, scribes, and, uh, and, and, and all the rest. He's going to bring it to an end. It's going to be over for Israel and the priesthood. And not only that, but they're going to go to Samaria and they're going to destroy their temple and their religion. And when it's all over, when it's all done, it will be over for all of them. But Jesus came speaking of a kingdom. And they were looking for one that would come and defeat the Romans and establish the kingdom. They thought Jesus might be him. They didn't like his message though and they turned on him and eventually crucified him. I want you to know by the end of the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ and after Pentecost and then after AD 70, the church is born and we have a new kind of worshipers. We worship Him in spirit and in truth and this spirit is not talking about the Holy Spirit. He's talking about our spirit. We have a spirit. We, wish, we worship Him with all of our heart, soul, mind and strength. We worship Him with our spirit. What I'm trying to say to you is with the coming of Christ and the ministry of Christ and the eventual crucifixion of Christ and the resurrection of Christ, He is starting a whole new deal. We're talking about the kingdom which is within us. Our personal, vital, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not dependent upon Mount Gerizim and the way they worshiped. It's not dependent upon the Jews and the temple and the tabernacle and the sacraments and the vestments and the Ark of the Covenant and, and the bronze altar and the Passover and all of the feasts and all of the shedding of the blood. You know what all of those things were doing? They were pointing to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is coming when Christ died. The Bible says that the veil of the temple was rent in twain. Why? Because uh, Christ was rejecting that because it was fulfilled. He said, I come not to destroy the law and the prophets. I come not to destroy it, but to fulfill. It was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And our hope is not in religion, beloved. It's not 
in a place that we go. Mount Gerizim or Jerusalem or this church or that church. It comes down to our personal, vital, intimate, saving relationship with Jesus Christ. As I've said to you many times, do you remember where Jesus asked the apostles, who do men say that I the Son of Man am? And, John the, and, and Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto you. I want you to know that the important thing, the most important thing, the vital thing, the critical thing, is our relationship with Jesus Christ. And he did not let her get off by saying, oh, well, let me have some of that. She must understand that God knows, God understands, but he still loves, he still sent Christ to die, and our salvation is based on the substitutionary death of the Lord Jesus Christ. But may the Lord help us to understand what's happened here and Jesus goes where? Samaria. Samaria. No, not Samaria. To the Samaritan. Oh, no, not to a woman. Not to a Samaritan woman. Surely not that woman. Donna thought I'd want to sing Amazing Grace today. I love that song. Because it says what I feel. And it was written by one of my great uncles, John Newton. You didn't know that, did you? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. I'm afraid that much of modern Christianity is selling it short, not letting people deal with their sins, not finding Christ as their Redeemer, not being not only forgiven of sin, but delivered from the power of sin. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. What a story! What an event! And I can tell you, it's not over yet. This chapter, this event goes through verse 44, and this is verse 26. The Lord is making a statement not only at that time with that woman, but to us. For well, there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It is Christ and Christ alone. I reminded them in Sunday school this morning. On the first of the year, I preached on the five solas of the Protestant Reformation. Some of you will remember that. That we are saved. And I, I remind myself of this. We are saved by grace alone. Through faith alone. In Christ alone. According to the word of God alone. And for the glory of God alone. And I'll scare you out of here when I say this. I'm thinking about re-preaching it the first of the year. Why, preacher, is foundational. The Lord said, you better build your house on the rock. Because the storm's coming. The storm's coming. And if you haven't built your house on the rock, your house will fall. And great will be the fall of it. Thank the Lord for His grace, for His mercy, for His forgiveness. It's not what we do for Him to deserve its salvation. It's what He has done for us by grace. May we stand together. 
Our Heavenly Father, somehow, O oh Lord, I pray that you would take this scripture and these truths, help us to see, help us to understand. O oh Lord, I just pray that the Holy Spirit would do what I fail to do. Help us to see what you have wrought in Christ. Now we're going to see what Christ does in the life of this woman and in the life of that town that she's, that she's in. Bless the Lord. Father, bless each one of us. Give us a hungering and a thirsting after righteousness. A thirsting to know you. A thirsting to worship you in spirit and in truth. You are the great God and there is none other. You are the creator and the sustainer. You are the one that gives us life. Bless the Lord. Take your word and minister to our souls. In Jesus' name. John Holstein, would you conclude the prayer, please, sir?